Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so excited to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change our world for the better. And we believe that everyone should be able to safely explore the wonders of our world. So our Explorer Classroom program is here to connect students from all over the world with our National Geographic Explorers digitally. Our explorers are amazing scientists, filmmakers, adventurers, researchers, photographers, and, and so much more. And once we're all together, we have a short lesson and an extended Q&A. And today we're very, very lucky to be joined by Bibek Jiri. Bibek was a geologist on the National Geographic and Rolex Perpetual Planet Expedition to Mount Everest, which was the most comprehensive single scientific expedition to this iconic mountain in all of history. Bebek is, is from a remote mountainous village just north of Kathmandu, Nepal, and is joining us today from Montana. Today, he's going to teach us all about Mount, Mount Everest, its geology, its importance, and its surrounding communities. Before we get started on that awesome lesson, I want to acknowledge that we're joined by students from all over the world. Some of them are up here on screen with me, and many more of them are watching along on YouTube. Today, our registered students represent Brazil, Canada, India, Ireland, Nigeria, Pakistan, Romania, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, American Samoa, uh, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maine, Maryland, Michigan, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Virginia. I think I got everyone today, but I, I might have missed someone. So if I didn't say your state or your country, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat bar. I would love to say hi and give you a shout out. But that is now plenty from me. It's time to turn it over to Bebek for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction, Celeste. Um, my name is Bibik, like uh, Celeste just told me, I'm a PhD candidate at Montana State University. I'm really thrilled to be here. And today I'll be talking about uh, a lot of stuff, really a lot of things, but most of them must be focused, uh, are gonna be focused on in and around Everest region. In this picture, you can see the Everest Base Camp. Just a note to you guys, all these pictures are most of the pictures that you will see in uh, my presentation were taken uh, last summer when I was in this amazing trip to Everest with uh, the National Geographic. So uh, all the pictures were taken um, then. And here you can see the Everest Base Camp, all these little yellow tents, that's where people live in this Base Camp region. Let's try to move it, it's around here. So yeah, and uh, this is the Khumbu Glacier, or ice fall people who want to summit Mount Everest go that way and it kind of comes down and makes a bend and goes southward that way and you can see the Everest or Mount Everest in the background we people from Nepal call Mount Everest Sagarmatha Sagarmatha that's how we call it people from Tibet or China call it Chomolongma and other people from the rest of the world call it Mount Everest uh, it is kind of problematic to take picture, a good picture, close-up picture of Mount Everest because it is covered by uh, mountains from all around, as you can see. So you need to be really close to Everest uh, to get that beautiful picture. And fortunately, okay, fortunately, we some people have done that. And here, something really cool in this image is as you can probably see that the rocks in here are much darker, right? The rocks in here are much darker than the rocks bounded by these two lines, which are much lighter. They're yellow in color. I don't think you can quite see the yellow color, but you kind of have to take my word on that. And this is what we call the yellow band, the yellow band of Mount Everest. And the rocks in the yellow band are limestone. So limestone is a sedimentary rock that forms on the bottom of ocean. So the rocks currently at the top of the world were once at the bottom of ocean. So how cool is that? 
on to next slide. Yeah, this is a picture of me uh, doing the trip again. It was taken by a National Geographic photographer. Thank him for that. Really beautiful image of mine, I love it. And, and there is a Chuyu in the background. So this fountain peak is called Chuyu. It's, a, it's, it's uh, in the valley just west of Everest and the valley is known as the known as Gokyo Valley. And this image uh, does a really good job of showing how large, how big these mountain peaks are. Um, all these mountain peaks, all these really tall mountain peaks lie in this mountain belt, in this mountain belt. And this mountain belt is called the Himalayas. You can see the tallest peak Mount Everest lies somewhere around there. Our capital Kathmandu would be uh, somewhere in here. And the second tallest peak Mount K2 would be somewhere around here in Pakistan. And really cool, a lot of cool stuffs in this uh, Google Earth image. We can see the Indian Ocean in here and there's a mountain, right? During summertime, moisture from this Indian Ocean travels northwards against the Himalayas and the moisture cannot go across the Himalayas. So you can see that the plateau of Tibet is much drier, right? It's almost like desert. You can see beautiful lakes, but more or less it's dry. Whereas Indian plate or the country of India is uh, much greener. It has a lot of uh, grasses and uh, trees. So you can see that how these mountain bills control the climate of, of the region. Another really uh, exciting stuff in this figure is, or in this image is that you can see the India, right? The continent of India is almost like triangle and there's Tibet. Um, Another name for this Tibetan plate would be Eurasian plate, like Europe plus Asia Eurasian plate. And you can see Indian plate going that way, kind of going that way, there's mountain belt. And the Tibetan plate is flowing, the crust itself is flowing that way. Can you see that? So I think I can convince you guys, you can almost see this like a river, the crust is flowing like a river. And this is what we call the southward extrusion of Tibet. Uh, a friend of mine at uh, Montana State University is looking at um, some of these features in Tibet, which I think is really cool. You can check uh, more about this image or, uh, in this place on Google Earth. So moving on to next slide. So let's talk about how the Himalayas uh, formed. So long ago, when I say long ago, like a uh, hundred of million years ago, the Indian plate was attached to African plate along with Australian plate. So all of them were together. Australian, uh, African, Indian plate were all together in a part of the Gondwana land. And then India and Australia broke off and then Indian plate started moving northwards. And about say 55 to 60 million years ago, the Indian plate collided with Tibetan or Eurasian, so whatever you wanna call it. And then we have the Himalayas. Um, the figure on the right does a better job of showing you guys, uh, there's Indian plate, there's Tibetan plate, they're coming together. And you guys probably know that the earth is layered. You might know it as crust, mantle and core. These are a bit technical terms that we use, but you can call it crust and these two is mantle, that, that's totally fine. And crust are two types, right? One is oceanic crust, the other one is continental crust. If they are uh, on ocean, then it's oceanic. If they are on continent, then it's continental. And continental crust are much lighter than oceanic crust. So you can see that the oceanic crust go, went down that way but the continental crust does not really want to go down because they are lighter. So they just want to be on the surface. You're pushing these two together, but none of them want to go down. So the only way that they can go is up. So that's how we form these Himalayan ranges or mountain ranges in general. So how did the Himalayas form? From a continental collision that started 55 million years ago. And just so you guys know that it's still going on, we still have this collision going on right now. 
Okay, then let's talk about faults. I don't know if you have heard this term or not, but uh, I guess you know San Andreas fault, right? This is where the term fault uh, comes from. You can see image on the left, there's a block. We are pushing two blocks together. So when we are pushing two blocks together, then one of them is gonna have to climb on top of the other, right? And the surface along which they move are called faults, geological faults. Then going back to the Himalayas, there's Indian plate, there's Eurasian plate, and the rock slices, the rock slices of packets of rocks is indicated by different colors you can see. They want to come to the surface, just climbing on top of each other along these major tectonic faults, major tectonic faults. And we can count how many, one, two, three, four. So there are major, four major tectonic faults in the Himalayas. Okay. So I don't know about you guys, but I was definitely not around 55 million years ago. So how do we know all these? How do we know what is going on so far back? And that brings us to what we as geologists do. So we rely on what we can see today. So we are um, kind, of like, kind of like detectives in that way. We just see what we see today. And based on our study, we figure out what was probably going on in the past. So. Uh, you guys can try and guess what you can see in this figure. This is a rock exposure. Um, I'll let you know. So this is what I see. You can see these rock layers, right? You can see all these rock layers. And I can almost see another layers, another packet or block of rock climbing on top of this one. And this is what a fault would look like. Of course, uh, when I say fault, it's gonna be a lot more complicated than that, but you guys get the general idea, right? You can almost see it climbing on top of uh, this one. And this is what we see in the field. Okay, let's talk more about field work. So this is me looking at an outcrop or exposure. So that's the name when, whenever we see any rock in a cliff, in a road cut, in river valleys, we call them outcrops or exposures. And this is me uh, looking at the exposure and I'm trying to take uh, take note of what rocks I see, what structures I see, uh, what minerals I can see. And you can see these are my notes. Um, and I also try to sketch. Sketching is always a good idea. Uh, not really good at sketching, but uh, they tend to work. And these are the tools I use. Uh, you can see my hammer and chisel. Uh, you guys probably guessed it right. I use hammer to break rocks. And there is the sample, I got it. So that's the sample I collected. This is my field diary, here it is. That's my field pouch. There it is. Uh, I keep, uh, I use these field pouches uh, so that I don't lose uh, pen and pencils. And there's my iPad. I use iPad to know where I am using a GPS device. And I can also take pictures with my iPad and I can also take notes in my iPad. Although I tend to take most of my notes in my diary. And there's a sample I collected. And this is the same sample that uh, from the last, uh, last slide. And I can see really beautiful, like these long crystals. You guys can see it, right? Some are green in color. I, I was really excited to see these. Uh, these are called kyanite, or at least for, uh, that's what I think they are. And what I do with this rock sample is I bring them back to my campus and I cut these rocks and I make thin sections out of them. And once I have thin sections, I look them under microscope. Um, just to note to you guys, these pictures, I got them from internet. So these are not from this rock, but in general, the, the rocks in thick, thin sections look um, kind of like this. So we understand uh, in more detail what's going on in those areas. Also, rocks are made up of minerals and minerals have these different elements like uranium, thorium, even potassium, which are radioactive elements, radioactive elements like Madame Curie. So um, what we can do with those is they tell us the A's of these rocks. So if I can date one of the minerals, then I know the A's of these rocks and I know the A's of those processes. So combining all the field work and all the lab analysis, I know what sort of processes were, were going on back then. And I know when they were going on. So that's how we try to understand, uh, well, this was 55, this was 40 million years ago and so on. 
Okay, we talked about false bringing or uh, making mountain pelts rise. Let's talk about the factors that are tearing them down. Glaciers, rivers, landslides, and other processes, they are tearing mountain belts down. And these processes are called geomorphological processes, or you can just call them surficial processes. Doesn't matter, let's look at, look at some pictures. Okay. Again, this is the, uh, this is the base camp reason, although you cannot really see any uh, tension here. I, you probably recognize Mount Everest in there. This is the Kumbu Glacier or Kumbu Ice Fall. So one thing I want you guys to note in this figure is that, can you see this cliff? So that cliff is cut by the Kumbu Glacier. So glacier coming down that way is cutting down the cliff and that's how much it has cut this cliff so far and still cutting it down. So glaciers constantly cutting mountain belts down. Another example, this one's uh, coming back to Gokyo. And this is the photographer that uh, took, uh, took the picture of mine. I took a picture of him, so we're even. And here you can see, this is the Gokyo Valley Glacier. That's mountains, mountains, rocks, so cut. So that's how much glaciers are cutting mountain belts down. And it's still going on. We just, we just see it how we see it, but these are always going on. And this one, not a glacier valley, rather this is a river valley. You can see a hilly coming towards us. See how tall the mountains are in here. Uh, I come towards the river channel. Channel is so deep that I cannot see the river, but that's how much the river has cut the mount cut the, this, this mountain ridge. And this one is another image of the same valley. The previous one was looking down the valley. I'm looking up the valley in this, uh, in this uh, photograph. There are people, there's a foot trail. Let's move on to next slide and landslide. So all this area covered by this red line is a landslide. And just to show you how big this landslide is, you can see the dots, right? All these dots, they're houses. So if houses are those, you can imagine how big the landslide was. So all these landslides, all these glaciers, all these river valleys and all the processes, they are constantly tearing these mountain belts down. Okay, so when we talk about geology, when we talk about tectonic processes, we're talking about millions of years. So we are talking at scales of millions of years, but we humans, have been here on earth for say 40,000 years. So how does really long time scale relate to us who are just living in a shorter time frame? And I'll, tr I'll try to answer that in a moment. Okay, let's go to Western Nepal. This is Western Nepal. That is uh, the fishtail mountain. It kind of looks like tail of fish. That's why it's called Fistel Mountain. One thing I would like you guys to note in this figure is that you can see how these mountains are snow capped. They're just rocky cliffs and they're really tall. And these are what we call high mountains. And one thing to note, whenever we look at mountains in our country, we're always looking north. We're looking north. So that's how, that's how we don't need any compass. We can just look at the mountains. If we see those high mountains, that's north. And there is this high mountains and if you come down south, there are these mid mountains. You can see the difference there. There's no snow cover in here. There is soil, um, a lot of trees, houses of people, and then there is a uh, farmland and so on. Another image, this is Pokhara and uh, it is Feral Lake. So you can see really beautiful uh, reflection of these mountains. That one's the freestyle mountain taken from a different angle. Here again, you can see the high mountain and you can see the mid mountain and houses and so on. One more image, high mountains. You can see a lot of river valleys. See how deep the valleys are. People harvesting crops. There are foot trail, foot trail there are houses. So high mountains and mid mountains. If we go further down to the south, almost close to India, we have this plain. We don't have a lot of plain, but we definitely have some of them. Okay, so we have the highest peak on earth. We have a lot of highest peaks. We have mid mountains, uh, like most of the mountains you can see in, uh, in the US, in Alps. 
and we have planes. So what does that mean to the culture, to, to the people living around? And you can, you can probably think about the culture being related to the surrounding, right? For example, I'm, I'm living in Montana and I don't really go to beaches because we don't have any beaches right around here. But what I do is I go to hiking, I go fishing, I go camping. If I, I were to be in Florida, I would probably go to beaches a lot, but not so much hiking, right? So the culture depends on where we live and the surroundings and so on. Um, so you can probably tell that the culture of people living in those high mountains are different from people living in those mid mountains which is again gonna be different from people living in the plain areas, the Parai Plains. And if we travel from east to west in our country, the culture is again gonna be different. So our country is not really, a, not really a very big country, but we have several culture, different uh, religion, a lot of languages, multiple languages are spoken in our country. And we have uh, what we call apple to pineapple. So apple is a fruit, found in cold places, you can grow apple in cold places and pineapple is a fruit in really hot places. So we can grow apple to pineapple. So we have sort of mini old in, uh, in that, small, um, in that uh, small land. And that's why the, our national anthem, the first line of our national anthem says, even from 100 flowers, we are garland Nepali. So we have a lot of ethnic groups, a lot of culture, a lot of, um, a lot of languages spoken and we're there, uh, unity and diversity. And this is the image of a temple. This is the image of a stupa. Stupa is kind of like temple for Buddhist people. And we have churches, we have mosques and so on. Okay, before I wrap up my, my presentation, I just want to go back to the Everest region and talk a little more about the Everest region itself. You can see those beautiful mountain peaks. I think this one's Campega and this one's uh, Tamserku, I think, yeah. And uh, these names are kind of difficult for me as well because I don't speak the local language here. The local language in this region is uh, Serpa. Those are the ethnic groups living in this high altitude region. Don't speak, I don't speak those, uh, that language. So it's difficult for me as well. But this is what a typical settlement looks like. Um, the uh, surrounding, the landscape is really beautiful. It's cold, but it's really beautiful. Houses, not so much, like eight to 10 houses, not really big, uh, big towns. You can see uh, foot trails. Yeah, these are green and there's uh, snow-capped high mountains. And you can see the river valleys. This one is Gokyo, again, the settlement of Gokyo. Um, I'm showing you guys a lot of picture of Gokyo. I, I like that place. Uh, this one's relatively a big town. And then on the side, on the side is a lake, the Gokyo Lake. Um, if you go down the valley, there are two more lakes. So that one right there, another lake. And there's one more lake down the valley. And there are four to five lakes up the valleys. So if we can find a lot of high altitude lakes in this uh, region and all in all all around the Himalayas. Uh, just a trivial fact for you guys, the lake, uh, the highest lake on earth is uh, I think Tilicho Lake that's also in Nepal. So just a trivia for you guys. Okay. And uh, eggs carry good for us. So see all those eggs carrying all these luggages for us. These are my friends, Aaron and Peter. Okay. More images of the, of eggs carrying goods, this one's, uh, back to the Everest Valley again. The previous one was Gokyo Valley. And you can see those beautiful mountains. And uh, people in this region tend to pile up rocks like so for good luck. And this one was piled up by me. You can see my backpack in there. Uh, I wanted a lot of good luck. So I, um, I tried to make it really big. So yeah. And in not just in Everest region, but in all high altitude region, most of the Serpas, they tend to carve these boulders along foot trail. And these are called Mani stones. And I cannot really read these writings, but these are Buddhist writings. This one's really beautiful. 
um, all these writings are, the script itself is beautiful, but it's colored, so that's even more beautiful. These are religious, so, and uh, the trend is you always wanna go, you always wanna make these on your right. So if you're going up the, up the valley, then you wanna go that way. If you're coming down, then you wanna go all the way around as much as possible. And this is the town of Namche. It's the biggest town in the Everest region. You can buy a lot of things in here. You can do a lot of things in here. You can see all these really big houses. That one's one, two, three, four, five storied. A lot of these houses are really tall and beautiful. You can see a stupa right there. Okay, finally, going back to the base camp, this is the Everest base camp of a friend of mine. And I believe that peak is Nupse. This is uh, at an elevation of 5,364 meters. Uh, for people from the US, that means around like 17,000 feet, I think. That's around 17,000 feet. Uh, so with that, I really wanna thank you guys for being here and listening to my presentation. I wanna thank National Geographic for providing me with this wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts and idea with you guys. And if you guys have any questions, I would so love to answer you guys. Thank you. Well, Bibik, I'm gonna thank you right back because that was absolutely amazing. There are so many just magical landscapes in Nepal and they look completely timeless and completely static. Like they've been that way forever. It's so cool to hear about how they've evolved and changed and how they're still changing today. Thank you for all of that. Um, and for folks watching along on YouTube, it's now time for you to start sending us your questions. Type those in the chat bar, hit enter. Um, let us know where you're watching from. Speaking of where folks are watching from, I wanna give a shout out to some students in Venezuela. I missed you in the introduction. Hi, Venezuela. It's lovely to have you here today. Um, and students up on screen with me, get those nice loud voices ready. I will let you know when it's your turn. Our first question comes to us from an aspiring geologist in India who is wondering how working with National Geographic has helped you in your career and what the importance is other than just funding? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, funding is always important, but when whenever I'm working with National Geographic, it's so much more than funding. It's, it's the brand, right? People from all over the world know what National Geographic is. They trust in National Geographic. If, I'm, if I say I work with National Geographic, then the way they, um, they believe in me or, or something. It's just, it's just that it's a really big brand and I'm really proud and really happy to be, to be a part of that big brand. And I, I guess there was two, question, two questions in, in that question, I think. What was the other one? Please? How has it helped you with your career? Uh, it, it has helped immensely. So one thing is uh, in the last expedition, there were 46 scientists along with me and my advisors. So you can see all those networking, right? I know now uh, meteorologists from England. I know people from University of Maine. I have now contacts with the people, more people from back in back home. I know a lot of people from different countries. So that's one thing. And another thing is I'm writing papers. So like I showed that uh, image of the landslide, it, uh, I'm writing the paper, which is funded by NASA Geographic. If, it was not for National Geographic, I would be doing something else. So now I'm getting experience in a lot of different fields. Like I said, my field of study is kind of different than what I did uh, back in the expedition, which was mostly focused on climate change. So now I have really good idea of um, climate change and all those, uh, all those other stuff. I also did lake coring. So that uh, paper is gonna be coming out. So it uh, the expedition provided me with a lot of networking um, and then sort of expertise in a lot of fields, different fields than my own. So thank you National Geographic for that. Awesome. And we've got a very different question coming to us from Angie, who is wondering if you've ever been in a dangerous situation up on the mountain. Um, so when we say dangerous, I mean, being in the mountains in those high altitude are always dangerous, but we are so cautious that we always try to avoid anything closely related to dangerous. So not really, but whenever we were, so the dangerous moment was like, whenever we were coring the lake, it was, it was really 
vertical, the, the leg was frozen, as you can see in, this, in the images that I showed you. And um, coring the leg was kind of difficult. We had these heavy equipments with us. Uh, we had to do everything with our hands, no machines, of course. And that our count is dangerous, but not really because we, um, we are trained, we were trained and uh, we are always trying to avoid uh, being in any place close to being dangerous. So not really. Awesome. Well, let's take our next question from an on-screen group. Let's go to Anian and Tille. Go for it. Um, so this is a question about Everest. So you has uh, China's takeover of Tibet in the 1950s ever affected anything about Everest, like tourism or maybe even the climate? Um, not really. So when you say about tourism, I uh, just want to let you know that there are two phases of Everest, of course, right? The northern slope and the southern slope. The southern slope uh, is in our country and the northern slope is in China or Tibet. And people prefer to climb Mount Everest from Southern Slope because it's much easier. Um, for a lot of reasons, it's much easier. So it has not really affected anything uh, with tourism and with climate. I don't think China taking on Tibet did anything to climate other than maybe industries opening up a lot of industries might do might have done something, but not the not the politics, not really. I hope that answered your question. Awesome. Well, let's take our next question from Eva, who's up on screen with us. Eva, let's turn on your microphone and you can ask nice and loud. Um, so how many meters high have you been up Mount Everest? Um, I've been to the base camp. Uh, I think the base camp was 5,364 meters. So I've not been higher than that. But uh, in, the, in that expedition, our group or the science team went all the way up to balcony, which was 8,400 meters. I was not the part of that team, but uh, yeah, I've only been to the base camp, which is uh, 5,364 5, meters. Cool. And we've got students in Kansas who are wondering what kind of obstacles you face. Uh, could you be more precise uh, so as to what sort of obstacles are you referring to? Yeah, what's a bad day like for a geologist? What's a big frustration for you guys out in the field? Uh, as a geologist, whenever we go to field, like I only work when there are rocks. Like I told you guys, I only work. I can only work when I see rocks, right? If the surroundings are just covered with uh, agricultural fields or forests, then I don't see any rocks. And if it's just flatland, then I don't see any rocks. So that's kind of frustrating or uh, not really frustrating, but it's difficult to gather data when we cannot really see any rocks. So those are the obstacles. And of course, in those mountains, um, we don't have a lot of villages. So you have to plan ahead of time. So this is where I'm gonna start. And I have to make this distance to get to another village. So you really need to balance time, how much time can you can you afford to spend on one side and so on. So balancing time is, uh, is I, I guess, the most difficult part in, in our job, at least in the field. Awesome. Well, let's take a question from Abby. Go for it. Hi, so I was wondering how the Himalayas eroding away would affect um, how it would affect other countries in Tibet and Nepal? Um, that's a really good question. So the erosion is going on, the mountain building is going on, and the erosion is, most of the erosion happens where, during monsoon, right? So there are flooding events and people plant crops in those the right plains. And if you have really big floods, then those crops are going to be ruined. Uh, that and there are always going to be landslides. Some of them are caused by earthquakes. And earthquakes are always, are always a threat. So yeah, this, and whenever you're living near and uh, near a river valley, you're always 
uh, going to be affected by those uh, floors and landslides. And now we are also dealing with GLOF, that's Glacial Lake Outbrush floors. So you remember the image I showed you, right? The Gokyo Lake. If we have lakes uh, even further up than that, then those lakes are probably going to be frozen. But with changing climate, those lakes are melting down. And we have all those geological faults. And what the faults do is they break or they weaken rocks. So it's easy for those uh, lake or water to cut down those rocks. So you combine climate change with, uh, with those falls and we have risk of uh, those glacial lake, uh, lake floods. So these are some of the issues um, related to erosion, I would say, for the, for the countries, uh, especially for Nepal and India, since Tibet is uh, kind of beyond or on the other side of the Himalaya, I don't know if uh, Tibet or China is affected that much by, by these processes, but definitely Nepal and India, yeah. Awesome, well, we've got Jax and Kate in Los Angeles who are wondering what kind of animals you've seen around Everest. Um, okay, so two types, right? One is domestic, one is wild. Uh, the domestic types are the ax, mules. Um, mules are a hybrid of donkeys and uh, horses, I think. So ax and mules and sheep are most of the domesticated animals, but for, uh, but for wild animals and birds, we can see Lobo forest or Dafe, that's, uh, that used to be our nestle bird. Really beautiful, it has color of rainbows, seven, uh, seven colors in its neck, I think. So really beautiful. And few other animals, it's no leopard, that's, that's really cool. It's almost like a mythical, mythical creature. You don't really see them. Um, and we, I know there's another animal we call Garal. I don't know what's the English translation for that. But not a lot of species in those regions, uh, but there are definitely some, and there are always going to be trees. And uh, now I think from our biology team, they found some sort of insect, Cassidy fly, at an elevation of 6,300 meters. So that, that was really cool. So yeah, those are the animals that I could, or uh, I did see um, when I was up there. Awesome. Let's take a question from Andrew, who's up on screen with us. Go for it, Andrew. Um, my question is, um, how cold was it at base camp? How cold was it at base camp? Um, it was, it was really cold. So, um, so when you say cold, when we talk about cold, there are two types of cold, right? If you're in equator, it's much warm than if you're in polar regions. So that way, Nepal is not really a cold country because it's closer to equator. So, but as we climb up the mountain, the air gets thinner and thinner, right? So it becomes more and more cold. And in base camp, it can be really cold, like uh, really cold, like negative 20 degrees Celsius. That would mean like almost like zero degrees Fahrenheit, but most of the people or all the people climb, uh, try to go to Mount Everest when it's summertime. So it's not as cold. It's still, uh, it's, not a, it's not freezing cold in daytime. It can be below freezing uh, when it's night, but during daytime it's not that cold, at least in, in summer season. Cool. All right, well, we've got Sanchit who is wondering how you monitor seismic activity within the Himalayas and how that seismic activity affects Nepal. Uh, that's a really good question. So the collision is still going on. So, and that is manifested through all these mega earthquakes. So the latest one was 2015, 7.8 magnitude Gorkha earthquake, so that was, uh, that was a disaster. Uh, but we have this, what we call micro seismicity, they are going on, so two types, big earthquakes and small earthquakes. So what, how we measure those? Um, there is a governmental agency known as the Nepal Seismological Center. They have all these seismological stations, sort of like network of stations, and those stations are constantly taking all those uh, micro seismic data 
And if the earthquakes are large enough, like the, like the last one, then even the stations in the US, even the station in China and other countries can pick those signals up. So it is constantly being monitored by network of all those uh, seismic stations. Awesome. Let's take a question from Brianna. Go for it, Brianna. My question is, what is an average day at Mount Everest? Uh, like average day meaning? Like what, what do you do on any given day when you're on an expedition up there? What, what were some of your responsibilities? Uh, like mine is, is myself. Um, okay, so we, so with National Geographic, when I went to Mount Everest, it was to cool lakes, those high altitude lakes that I, that I showed you. So most of the times it was just trekking and getting to there. And then the day of cooling, the day when we actually cool lakes, our job was to prepare the board, prepare all this, um, all those equipments, and then go to the lake and try to some core and then come back. Uh, if we're successful, then we would uh, enjoy. And then if we're not, then always try for the next day. So yeah, if you go to the average region, um, unless you're a Sherpa or you're a climber, then you're basically just trekking up and down. So that's, that's kind of all you do. And you don't really need to cook your meals for yourself and um, you don't need to make camps or tents. So basically you're there just trekking, just hiking. Awesome. Well, we've got Anne who is wondering how the coronavirus has been affecting tourism and communities around Everest. Uh, it is uh, greatly affecting the tourism industry because now it's the summertime and people cannot travel. So yeah, the effect has been uh, devastating and it, is, uh, it has been devastating in our country, not only in the Everest region, but all around our country, there are different tourist uh, sites you know that Everest is just one of the mountains, one of the 8,000 meters mountains out of uh, eight, I think, out of eight or 13 that we have. We have Annapurna, we have Makalu, we have Choyu, we have so many, those really tall, beautiful mountains. Uh, and people don't just go to the Everest, people go to all those mountains and now they cannot. And we also have all those cultural sites, like those temples, like those stupas that people cannot really go. We have different places that you can visit apart from mountains, but uh, the tourism industry is almost shut down right now because of, because of the virus and uh, yeah, it is, it is devastating. Awesome. And we've got Sydney in Los Angeles who is wondering how you became a geologist. How did you know that, that rocks were your thing and, and what do you love most about this job? Um, so, when so like I said, I grew, I don't think I said it. So I grew up in, grew up in mountains, right? And people often ask me, "Do you hike or did you used to hike or something?" And I always say to them, "I grew up in mountains, so if I take a walk, that's a hike." So I saw a I used to see a lot of mountains and always keep on wondering how those mountains were formed. Why do we have all these uh, natural features that I can see? And once I was done with high school. I didn't know back then when I was doing my high school, I didn't know I could study those mountains. I didn't know there was a subject called geology where you get to study those mountains. And uh, when I learned, when I was joining campus, I learned that I could actually study them. I was really happy. And so that's one reason. Another reason is you get to travel and you get to travel new places and traveling always means meeting new people, knowing different cultures. So that's always nice, right? So you get to travel, meet new people, and then come back and see what you you could uh, you could uh, you got in the field, and then uh, trying to piece together, trying to uh, solve the mystery. So that's that's what I really love about what I do, and that's why I think I became a geologist. Love it. All right, and Vivek, do you have any advice for all the young explorers out there joining us today? Um, I, yeah, when, when, whenever you guys want to do something, when you guys want to do something really big, right? So say anything, anything you want to do, which sounds really big and which sounds really terrifying, 
always try to break them down into pieces, right? What can you do today? Don't worry about tomorrow. So if you keep on doing what you can do today, then you will have an idea by the end of the day what you probably want to do tomorrow and so on and so forth. So it's just like saying the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. So always try, whatever you do, always try to break them down into pieces, take your steps slowly, as comfortable as you are, and you'll eventually get there. So awesome. Well, thank you, Vivek. And for everyone out there watching, you can check out Explore Classroom plus many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. We'd love to it, we would love to see your work. You can share it with us on Twitter, um, tagging at natgeoeducation and using hashtag Explore Classroom. That way we can make sure all of the wonderful folks like Vivek get a chance to see what you guys are doing too. Um, and you can always tune in here for Explore Classroom. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, we have our photo camp series for older students where you get to interact directly with National Geographic photographers and complete your own photo challenges. It, it's pretty cool. I hope to see some of you guys there. And as we sign off today, let's turn on everybody's microphones nice and loud and say goodbye and thank you to Vivek. Ready? Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>